Three rednecks go fishing. They cast their lines. Leave it there. It's black. It's for a reason. Oh, okay. Got it there. I knew that would throw you. I thought you broke it. So there's, uh, they all three cast their lines into the lake, and they all three start reeling in at the same time. And they, their lines get tied up and they get hung. So they're all just sitting there yanking and pulling, yanking and pulling. <clears throat> well, they all three give one last heave, and tangled up in the wires is a lamp, a genie lamp. And so as they're untangling the wires from it, one of them rubs up against it, and out comes a magic genie. No, not genie, the waitress at the Waffle House, a magic genie. Now, the three rednecks are staring at this genie, and the genie is staring back at them, and she's like, well, I don't know which one of these guys rubbed the lamp. I don't know who to give the wishes to. So she says, all right, fellas, here's the deal. I don't know who rubbed the lamp, and you guys, obviously, by the looks of you, aren't going to be able to tell me who rubbed the lamp either. So everybody gets one wish. You're first. And so Leroy starts scratching his head, And says, well, you know what? I'm sick and tired of him acting like he's smarter than me. I want to be twice as smart as Leroy, as as Jethro. And so she says, are you sure that's the wish you want? And Leroy says, yeah, I want to be twice as smart as Jethro. And she says, okay, your wish is granted. And he starts reciting Shakespeare. Never cracked a book in his life. Just starts reciting Shakespeare off the top of his head. He's twice as smart as Jethro. So then she comes to Jethro, and Jethro's all puckered up. And he says, well, that ain't fair. Now I want to be twice as smart as you just made him, because I don't want him to be smarter than me. So she says, are you sure that's what you want? And he says, yeah, that's what I want. That's what I want my wish to be. So she says, all right, your wish is granted. And he starts reciting long-range algebra just off the top of his head. This guy can't balance his checkbook. And he's reciting these mathematic equations. Well, then they come to the third one, Earl. And she says, all right, you're up next. And Earl's sitting there scratching his head, and he says, well, I got one better for all of yous. I don't like neither one of them two being smarter than me, so I want to be ten times smarter than them two put together. And the genie says, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I I really don't think you're prepared for that much brain power. I think you might want to reconsider your wish. He says, no, 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 no. That's my wish. I get my wish. That's what the wish I want. I want to be ten times smarter than them two put together. you got to give me my wish. So she says, all right. Your wish is granted. She made him a woman. Now, Why would I tell you that to start off a talk about storytelling? Because stories are memorable. Stories connect dots in our brains. And we associate them with where we are, with who we were with, with the person that told the story, with some other memory from that event. And so hopefully, whenever you hear a joke about a redneck, you might actually think of this little storytelling talk. But I want to tell you, some more stories about some rednecks and some hillbillies, as if y'all didn't realize I'm uh, from the south side of Chicago. Um, I'm actually from eastern Kentucky, and eastern Kentucky has had some stories told about it over the years, at least the Appalachian region. They were never, never specific about Kentucky, but everybody knows this story. Probably everybody in this room, even those of you younger than the age of 50 or so who saw this uh, when it aired live can recite this story. Come and listen to my story about a man named Jed, poor mountaineer, barely kept his family fed. Then one day he was shooting at some crude, and up through the ground come a bubbling crude. We all know that story, right? Well, that story is actually a false narrative. How many of you have ever been to eastern Kentucky? Anybody here ever been to eastern Kentucky? We've got some hands. That's good. Chicago's a little bit closer in proximity. So when I told this in Toronto, not a single hand in the room. Uh, But the first time, however, that you went to eastern Kentucky, especially if you were a little younger, maybe a little less worldly, the thought might have walked through your mind, oh, wait a minute, they're wearing shoes. 
oh my goodness, they're not driving Model T's. Holy crap, right? Because a false narrative, a false story has been portrayed about my neck of the woods all these years. And so that story is one that people remember that we don't want them to remember. And so a couple of friends of mine got together not too long ago and decided, you know what, we're going to try to tell a different story about Kentucky because we love Kentucky, we love our state, and we have just as many wealthy and just as many poor and just as many smart and just as many stupid and just as many you know, worldly and open-minded and just as many dumb and close-minded people as any other place in the world. We just have mountains and a little bit of an accent. Eastern Kentucky is not a lot different than any other place, uh, at least in the Western world. It just happens to have a little bit different character. And so these two friends of mine decided that they they were advertising creatives uh, at an agency, and they had the opportunity to pitch the State Tourism Commission for the big tourism account for the state of Kentucky, Travel Kentucky. And they approached them with... A pretty unique idea to tell a better story about Kentucky. The story that Kentucky, in fact, kicks ass. Now, the, uh, being the bureaucratic, an arm of the bureaucratic uh, mess that is state government in any state, I'm not just talking about Kentucky, the Travel and Tourism Commission people there uh, said thanks but no thanks. And so they sent these guys on their merry way. And they were so frustrated that they didn't get because they loved the pitch. They loved the idea. They had all these great ideas on how to sell Kentucky to the world and reframe that story. That they really were passionate about it. And they really wanted to do it. So they went ahead and did it. And they started coming out with all these videos. The very first video was them on the state capitol steps declaring that they were hijacking the state tourism uh, campaign uh, after they had lost the bid, and they were going to start their own campaign called Kentucky Kicks Ass. There's nothing against it. They weren't going to get in trouble. They weren't saying they were the official voice of Kentucky. They just started an organization called Kentuckians for Kentucky, and this was their their mantra and their campaign. They came out with stickers, which are now seen on probably about 25, 30% of the cars around the state of Kentucky now. Kentucky Kicks Ass. Um, And then they started getting these ideas of, wait a minute, people are asking for more stickers. They're asking for T-shirts. Maybe we could sell some stuff. And so they started to sell some stuff online, and then they sold enough stuff that they realized, holy crap, we might have a business idea on our hands here. And then they had a business, and they wanted to see, well, what what happens if we actually start to take our personality and our ideas and put it toward marketing this business? Let's tell a better story about how to sell things on the internet and sell things off the internet. So they got a little creative and a little fun, as they are wont to do. Do you love Kentucky? Yeah, you do. Are you a proud Kentuckian? Yeah, you are. Well, come on down to the Kentucky Fun Mall, y'all. Kentucky's largest selection of Kentucky gear. Glassware. Fried chicken candles. Plenty of parking. Southern socks. Kids gear. Kentucky gear. Y'all gear. We got 12,000 square feet of fun for everyone. Now, this is a 30-second television commercial, and uh, it only aired one time, as you could probably guess why. Um, And it wasn't because he was shirtless. (laughs) Um, But it only aired one time. However, this is also a great story about this store. And it's a story that caught fire when they put the story and the commercial online. So much so that they wanted to show everyone how effective that one aired television commercial was. Quiet on the set. Rolling. Action. Do you love Kentucky? Fuck yeah, you do. Free parking on the north side of town. We'll watch your car. Home goods. Fried chicken candles.
Kentuckian? <laughs> yeah, you are. Plenty of parking. Southern socks! Go to get here. So, this is all because they reframed the narrative of the state of Kentucky, and they reframed the narrative on how to sell things. They just said, you know what, we're going to put some personality behind it. We're going to tell some stories. And probably the best story they told is the story of Cocaine Bear. Now, I'm going to read this to you in case you can't see it. Here sits Cocaine Bear. In 1985, Cocaine Bear was found dead in the Chattahoochee National Forest. He overdosed on 40 kilos of cocaine dropped by Andrew Thornton. You might remember Andrew from the Bluegrass Conspiracy. Don't do drugs or you'll end up dead and maybe stuffed like poor Cocaine Bear. Now, I haven't the slightest idea if that's true. I don't know where they got the damn bear, but they have a stuffed bear. And they say that the stuffed bear died from an overdose of cocaine out in the middle of the forest. So they have it stuffed with a Kentucky hat and a gold chain uh, in the back of a broken down flatbed pickup truck in their store. And it's now a freaking tourist attraction. People bring their children to have their picture made with something called cocaine bear. <laughs> this, I mean, it's, it's absurd, but it's also brilliant. It, they, they, they had that one television commercial aired on a channel. It wasn't this one that came out and did a story about Cocaine Bear. So they're getting all this free publicity because they figured out how to make it fun and tell a different narrative, frame a different story about how Kentucky kicks ass and how their store sells things that sort of validate that notion that Kentucky does kick ass. Now, what makes stories or content stand out? Well, they disrupt the normal. This obviously was disruptive. Think of the stories that you go home and tell your family around the dinner table at night or that you tell your friends over a drink at the bar in the evenings or on the weekend. Think of the things that you repeat. They disrupt your normal. They stand out from the mundane, the stuff that you see and hear every day. They capture your attention. They trigger an emotion. They might make you laugh, but they might also make you cry. They might also make your heart bleed. There's lots of ways that an emotion can uh, be triggered and can affect you to the point to where you turn, want to turn around and tell someone about that. And they normally make you turn around and want to share it. Certainly there are some stories that we come across that touch us in a deeply personal way that we don't feel like sharing with people, and that's fine. But this is sort of the key blueprint to good storytelling. Now, what I want to talk to you about today, though, is how do we take these key elements, these thoughts, and put them into a narrative, into social media content and the content that we're putting out there on the internet for our brands and businesses. Because my hypothesis is, is if we are able to engage our audiences in these sort of attention-grabbing, emotion-seeking, shareable, moment-inducing journeys and narratives, then our content will resonate better with them. They will turn around and talk about us more and to more, more people and more often, and we'll be more successful with our social content. If you're not following Charmin on Twitter, you should. These are some examples of some one-off stories, little narratives that we see on social media. This happened to be the first time I ever saw a tweet from Charmin. It was the day after Labor Day weekend. Uh, and it was that awkward moment when you realized that extra scoop of chili on the hot dog wasn't such a great idea. Happy Labor Day. Hashtag tweet from the seat. I lost my mind. I laughed my ass off because this came from a toilet paper. This is the big white wall aisle in the grocery store, a brand in that big, just monotonous noise of nothing just spoke to me on Twitter and made me laugh. I almost fell out of my chair, and I immediately went to the bathroom so that I could participate <laughs> because I wanted to tweet from the seat too, damn it. And, 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 and tell me that social media content doesn't have an effect on sales. 
I can tell you right now from that day on, that was September 3rd, I want to say 2000, I don't know, 12. I don't know, remember what year it was. But from that day forward, there has not been another single white sheet of anything else in my house. I buy Charmin. I buy the Charmin wet nap thingies that go along with the dry Charmin. I only buy Charmin. And when people come into my house with things other than Charmin, I say, get that shit out of here. I want my Charmin. (laughs) Like this affected sales, at least for me. And if you are a fan of brands or if you happen to come across something like this and you have at least a modest sense of humor in your life and you like to laugh at things, you're going to go, holy shit, a toilet paper just made me laugh. Wow. And you're going to remember who it was, right? Because none of the other toilet papers are doing anything other than sitting there all round and white and almost soft, right? So this is memorable, and this tells a story, even though it's a very short one. But remember, it's just a one-off thing. I want to, this is, I'm kind of going somewhere with this, so bear with me here. This was a one-off thing. I love Charmin's social media channels, though, because this is what they do. They have potty humor, (laughs) but... It's really clean. Like, I can go home and read their tweets to my kids. And it's not, like, offensive. It's not bad potty humor. It's clever. It's silly. It's funny. It's a freaking toilet paper company. It kind of has to be, right? And so, if you're not following Charmin on Twitter, please do. And they love it when I talk about them because eight or ten people tweet about them. And they're like, hey, Jason Falls is talking somewhere again. That's pretty cool, which is funny. They actually reached out to me at one point and said, "Um, how much would you like? And I was like, oh, dear God, no. No, no, no. Please do not send me a crate of toilet paper. I, I'll be fine. I can purchase my own. Thank you very much. I appreciated the gesture. Um, Dollar Shave Club, on, uh, this is an Instagram post. Um, just clever, sense of humor, obviously connected to the brand with facial hair, right? Um, fun, interesting. Uh, if you are a Dollar Shave Club uh, member, subscriber, their blog and their email content has gotten infinitely or exponentially better over the course of the last uh, year or so. And every month it just keeps getting better. And it's really, it's very targeted toward that sort of, you know, uh, 18 to 35 or 45 year old male. So there's a little bro humor and stuff in there. So not everybody in the room is going to like it. But at the same time, it's very targeted. It's very smart. It's very engaging. It's the kind of content that you're going to read and go, holy crap, I need to share that with my friends, or I need to talk about that this weekend when we go to the bar and have a few drinks. So it's the type of content that you're going to pass along. But again, this is kind of a one-off thing. It's not a narrative. It's not a story. They're not tying anything together yet. Um, This is actually a good one for Moon Pie. I don't know if you guys, I'm sure you guys kind of know what Moon Pies are. They're kind of like Southern Little Debbies, but not really. Um, and uh, they're snack cakes, but when they, when they had the blue, ecl- the blue moon eclipse back in the, whenever that was, um, I'm not an astronomer, uh, so they made this kind of cool post that had the moon as a moon pie, and they had like a wolf over it, like howling or something, so they did a video on Facebook where they basically just show this is how we created that. Uh, image. They, they had a picture of a moon pie. They had a picture of the moon. They did the blue overlay of the moon. They superimposed it on the moon pie. Then they brought in the wolf. So they had this little, hey, here's how we made that cool image that we did on blue moon day or whatever it was. So tells a story, is very in, informational and engaging to their audience. Not everybody's going to be really interested in how they created it, but it's kind of fun. You're like, oh, wow, that's kind of neat how that happened, right? Um, and so again, but a one-off, one-time thing. The problem with social media, the way we've been doing it as brands and as companies, is that one post happens, and then what? You got the rest of the calendar to fill. And if you fill that calendar with another one-off post, and then another one-off post, and then another one-off post, you're just... You're just throwing softballs out there. You're not tying anything together. You're not bringing your audience along. You're not moving them toward a sales funnel. You're not moving them toward an end goal. You're just being there for the sake of being there. And if that's all you're doing, you're never going to get what you want out of social media from a business or a marketing perspective. So I want to propose a a couple of, of things that will help you. 
first of all, find the brands that you uh, follow or that you're interested in uh, that are using Instagram and Facebook stories, especially the ones that are using it a lot because they will inspire you. This is one of our clients at Cornette. This is Keeneland Racetrack, a thoroughbred race course uh, in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, and they also do the big thoroughbred yearling sales. So all the derby winners and, the, and whatnot are usually bought at Keeneland uh, when they do the auctions. And so it's a very famous, prestigious race course in Lexington, Kentucky. Now, they are a client, but I will tell you, uh, my team, the social team and the content team, we don't have anything to do with their social. They own their social and do it internally. So I'm not showing off what we did. I'm showing off what our client does. They're, they do a great job with their social media without our help. Um, we're there if they have questions, but they do all this themselves. So during the off season, after the Triple Crown races go in, they have a spring meet and then the Triple Crown races start, and so as to not compete with Churchill Downs and whatnot, they sort of shut down, and then they have uh, a, uh, a paddock dinner series because they want to keep people coming out and people engaged with Keeneland, but they don't have races running uh, during the summer months. So for their paddock dinner series this spring, they started promoting it, the first one, with an Instagram and Facebook story. So can't wait to debut the series tonight. These all happened over the course uh, of about an hour. Okay, so this was the evening as they led up to the first one. And of course, these are sort of high dollar events that you have to RSVP and pay to go to. So what they're doing with their Instagram and Facebook stories here is they're previewing what you get if you buy, if you come to one of these. This is the first in a series of them. So they've got the sign and they're saying, hey, you can get a mint julep or a cocktail here. They're showing off the menu and then they kind of show the setting, the table settings. Then they start going through. Think about this. If you do anything involved involving a meal or an event, they've just gone through and step by step, okay, what's the salad look like? Who made it? What are the ingredients? What's the next step? Hey, here's wood, uh, wood fired grilled peaches with warm goat cheese. Okay, uh, that might sound good to somebody. I'm not sure I would like it, but you know. Uh, next one, rough, uh, rough Draft Farms, which is a local farm to table place. Um, a uh, farm that, that does farm-to-table supplying, pan-roasted vegetables, and then they go on and show you them actually doing the roasting, how they're preparing the meal. This is one dinner, one event, and they're going on about every 15 or 20 minutes. They're posting another thing on their Instagram story, completely locking in their Instagram and Facebook audience into being able to see and experience this event right along with the people that are there, even though they're not there, and lathering up their taste buds and their expectations for when they get to come to the next one or when they can make an RSVP or purchase tickets to number two, number three, number four, etc. And of course, they close it all off with, hey, here's, here's all of us kind of gathered around the table enjoying this wonderful evening out uh, at Keeneland. So a wonderful job of, of storytelling in a narrative form where you're tying things together. Now, again, this is one event and Instagram and Facebook stories don't last very long. They're only going to be seen uh, over the course of a 24-hour period by your audience. But what I would argue is, is it's great inspiration for us as marketers to say, okay, how can we take that idea, that narrative idea, that chronological narrative point A to point B, moving people along a path and translate that into our blogs, our email newsletters, our Facebook posts, our Instagram posts, our tweets, and so this is sort of what I've been uh, uh, ruminating on uh, over the course uh, of the last couple of months with some of our clients. Another thing with Keeneland here, during race season, real simple, you've got knowledge, you've got experience and expertise, turn it into step-by-step -step storytelling. Here's how to bet across the board, step one, step two, step three. They just go through with their stories and they're educating their consumer on how to actually spend money at the racetrack. Now, obviously, if you are a retail store, you don't have to educate people on how to spend money in a retail store. But you get the point. You have some level of expertise. The questions that your customers often ask, turn them in to step-by-step -step storytelling answers on your social media channels. And now, all of a sudden, you're not only doing them a service, you're probably leading many of them right to your doorstep. So here's what I'd like to talk to you about today. The story arc. So this is a story arc, a typical story arc from a, a narrative fiction book uh, or, or tale. 
So you have an awful life and you're a slave to your stepmother. But you get invited to the ball. So you dream of a night out. And you go to the ball and you dance with the prince. And the clock, though, is about to strike midnight. So you've got to hurry home and you go back to your awful life. But you're better because you have a great memory of a, a wonderful evening that you had out. But wait, you left your slipper and the prince finds it. And he goes on a hunt for the person who lost their slipper. And he finds you. And then you reunite. And you live life happily ever after. So this is obviously the story arc for Cinderella. So this is not an atypical story arc from really any work of fiction out there. Any movie, any book, uh, any play, any narrative. My hypothesis and what we've been testing with planning content for our clients over the course of the last year or so is we can turn our content into narrative story arcs and we can align this arc with the life cycle, the buying journey of our customer. So let me walk you through a couple of ideas on how that works. The types of story arcs that you typically see are the rise to prominence, kind of like the Excalibur story with King Arthur. The fall from grace, Michael Corleone has to commit a crime and go into hiding in Godfather Part 1. He actually does the the, the next one, Return to Grace, in Godfather Part 2, at least grace within the family as he comes back and becomes the Godfather himself. But probably a little bit more peaceful analogy for Return to Grace is, uh, of course, the Lion King story. And then weakness to strength. This is any sort of love story where you're lonely and you find love or you don't believe in Christmas, and then at the end of the movie, you do believe in Christmas. And so these are the typical story arcs that you see uh, in stories out there. So here's one. So let's say you're looking for a car, and uh, you learn that uh, one of the automakers that you are interested in has won a J.D. Power Award, uh, and so you start browsing online and looking at that particular automobile maker. And then you say, you know what, this really interests me, so I'm going to actually go test, uh, I'm going to go to their website, and I'm going to go through that build your own experience, and I'm going to subscribe to their email newsletter, I'm going to sort of fantasize about what it's going to be like to own one of those cars, and see, I'm going to pick out my favorite color, and the interior, and all the bells and whistles, and then you see the price of the build your own version, and you start to come down that slide of, oh, i got to go back to my miserable life where I don't have that car, right? But you put off further shopping while you're saving for a future purchase, but you start thinking, you know what, how can I afford that car? Because you want it, and you think, you know what, maybe I could achieve that one day. Maybe I could save my money. Maybe I could, you know, uh, some of my investments might pay off. Somehow I could get to a point where I could afford that build-your-own version. So you start talking to your banker friend about financing, and you're like, wait a minute, this is actually feasible. So now you go test drive the car, and now all of a sudden you're at that happily ever after stage where you make that purchase and you drive away happy. So now we've mapped a story arc to an actual customer purchase of something. So let's think about how we can map a story arc like this to your customers and how they engage with your company and your business. So here's the customer journey. I'm going to break each one of these down to be a little bit more specific about it. I've put some labels on it so that you can sort of fill in the blanks with this. Um, You have the first contact, the point of curiosity, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want to read these to you because I'm going to go through each one of them step by step, but I'll leave the slide up for a couple more seconds for those of you who are trying to take a picture of it. Um, Eventually, uh, basically, the, the peak of visualization, obviously, is the point where you've got the customer excited. You're like, okay, okay, I can see myself driving this car. I can see myself having a happy retirement if I make this investment. I can see my kids getting a better education if they go to this school. I can see this. I can visualize what's going to happen. But then that slide of resistance is normally when they see the price tag or it might be some other area of hesitation. So let's go through each one of these and see what they are. The point of curiosity after they've had that first contact is really when they learn something about your brand that makes them want to know more. Maybe uh, they learn that you give back to the community. Maybe uh, they uh, experience an advertisement. Maybe they meet one of your employees and they have a really good experience talking to them. Uh, Maybe they hear about you on the news. Maybe your PR team has done a good job of getting the word out about you. It's that first point of contact that makes them say, okay, I'm not just aware of who these folks are. Now I'm sort of interested. I'm curious. I want to know a little bit more. 
Then they get into that path of discovery. They're heading toward that peak of visualization. So this is where they start searching for you. This is why search engine optimization is so critically important to your business because that's where they're going to touch you before you know they're trying to touch you. They are trying to find out more about you, and they're going to go to the search engines first because that's where they can find information without really having to have the bother of actually talking to anyone or anything like that. They might visit your retail locations. They'll come to your website. They might ask people for referrals and recommendations. Hey, have you ever driven this kind of car? Have you ever been to this kind of business? Have you ever invested in this type of thing? Um, they might look at consumer reports or Yelp ratings, etc. And so they're, again, building up that momentum to get to that peak of visualization. And this is where they see themselves being able to make this purchase, to invest in this, uh, to, you know, make this reservation to go on this vacation, to go on this trip, to wear those clothes, et cetera, et cetera, or finally get that repair done to the house, whatever it is, they can visualize it, they're excited about it, they're lathered up, and then they see how much it's going to cost. Or they talk to their spouse or some other person who might have to contribute to it, and there's some hesitation or pushback from them. Or there's some other changes in their life that prevent them from logistically being able to pull it off right now. Um, or you know, maybe it's going to impact some other long-term financial goals that they can't really account for. So now they've got this want, this desire, they can visualize it, but then they've got this resistance. They've got something in the way, that barrier that they need help overcoming. So they're going to reach that sort of plateau of indecision when they're going to put it off, but they're still going to be percolating on it. They might be hesitating. They may not be confident they can buy, but they know they want it. They, it's out there somewhere. They've got, they're in that consideration process, and they've probably even gone past consideration, but there's those barriers in the way that we have to help them get past. So they may lose interest here if something else distracts them that's going to take that money away, that's going to take that budget and put it somewhere else. So we have to really be careful about delivering the right content to this audience at this point. But at the same time, we're going to have to try to do something to get them through this plateau of indecision and move into the uh, m momentum on-ramp, because this is where that visualization gets rekindled. They start to overcome those objectives. They start to convince the other input people in the decision-making process that this is the right thing. They start to save the money. They start to figure out how they're going to afford it and pay for it. Now they're starting to figure out, okay, this is possible. I can do this. And then they get that reignition of the visualization by coming to test drive, by going back to your website, by exploring all of the bells and whistles that they can add on to it, by maybe calling and talking to a sales representative, uh, or even you know coming in and, and visiting your showroom, whatever your business may be. Now you these these folks are hooked. They're probably going to purchase. You would have to really treat them like crap for them not to convert at this point. And then obviously you want to get them to the happy conclusion. So let me show you what it looks like. And I'm going to show you what it looks like from a brand that, from a marketing standpoint, uh, we work with uh, Wheatley Vodka at, at Cornette, which is one of the many Sazerac brands we work with. It's a relatively new brand, um, but it's an interesting uh, uh, brand to try to work with because we help market Wheatley Vodka, but we, don't, we can't sell it directly to consumers, right? The brand distributes spirits and alcohol through distributors and whatnot. Uh, we, we can sell only to uh, liquor stores and restaurants and bars we can't sell to direct consumers. So we have to build awareness so that you will go to the bars and the restaurants and say, hey, I don't want vodka, I want Wheatley vodka, right? So that's pr our primary objective here. So we have to be creative with their content. Quick primer on this, new to the market in the last five years or so, it's an American craft vodka. Uh, it is uh, in an entry in a market uh, dominated by the uh, uh, large uh, companies that have uh, mass uh, product, mass product um, uh, vodkas out there that have been doing it for forever, and just you know flood the uh, the, the the liquor stores and the shelves with their product. Uh, it does have the historical lineage lineage of the Buffalo Trace Distillery, which has been making bourbon mostly for the, uh, the last 200 years. So there's a lot of his, uh, history there. There's a lot of heritage behind the distillation and the distillery process there in Frankfort, Kentucky. Uh, Wheatley Vodka launched from a, a digital standpoint with just social channels, not really a website. There wasn't a need for a website uh, for the first couple years of the brand. We were really just trying to build some awareness uh, and maybe some consumer buzz around it. 
Um, now it does have a website, and that's actually one of the impetuses that we had to be able to start telling some stories around them. The types of content uh, that we had been uh, producing for Wheatley and still do, but in a slightly different way now, um, kind of fell into four main buckets. We talked about Wheatley and, and combining it with food. So it's something that you're going to match up with a food pairing because you might enjoy a cocktail or a Bloody Mary or something like that with a meal. Uh, we talk about the cocktail and the spirit itself and drinking it and what it tastes like and what you might mix it with if you're making a cocktail. We talk about the craft process. It's a very hands-on, crafted product. It's not just swill that they throw in a bottle and slap a label on. It's actually distilled 10 times. They take a lot of care to make it taste just right. Uh, and so we talk about Harlan Wheatley, who it's obviously named after, the master distiller at Buffalo Trace. And if he's going to put his name on it, you know it's going to be something that he took a lot of care with. So we talk about the process a lot. Um, and then we have these little sort of quotes and inspirational memes and whatnot that we put out there that kind of connect the brand with the consumer in an interesting way. Doesn't necessarily talk about uh, the spirit itself, but sort of talks about the attitude of the brand. Uh, the primary product of a great master distiller is happiness, an old Kentucky proverb, which is about uh, six and a half months old and written by a really good copywriter. <laughs> you know, that's how those things go, right? So anyway, this is the type of content that we produce for Wheatley. Well, then we said, you know what? We have a photographer, and we send them out to take pictures of our bottle and cocktails in bars and whatnot, but we want to celebrate craftsmanship because Wheatley is a craft vodka. It's a craft product. So why don't we just tie it to, that could be a theme for us, tying it to craftsmanship. So we started going to places like uh, uh, to, to see terrain glass designs in North Carolina. This is Colin O'Reilly there in the toboggan, uh, and he's a glass blower. And he is actually making these sort of beautiful serving containers over here uh, that are meant to uh, serve any type of liquid. But for us that day, he was making them for uh, for spirits, for Wheatley Vodka, um, and we just filmed and shot the process. So we're celebrating another craftsperson who is making something uh, handcrafted to go along with our handcrafted vodka. And so we started telling these stories of, hey, kind of here's the process. This was an Instagram uh, mostly thing. We did it on Facebook as well. But it was really kind of a visual thing, just kind of bringing the story along of showing the craft. And you'll notice that a couple of these shots, we didn't even really have the product shot in there. We're telling the story. The copy that went with it was kind of telling the story about who Colin was, what he was doing, and that he was making something that would serve the product. So it was sort of related, but it was really about celebrating him and the process. So that was sort of our beginning of our inspiration. And then we had the opportunity to say, okay, We've got this new website coming. What are we going to do? Because this website has a lot of features, um, and we're telling this story of craftsmanship, but how are we going to sort of tie this into a bigger story and get people to come to this website? Well, the website features the brand story. It features a lot of information about how Wheatley Vodka is made. We also have sort of the recommendations and referrals from bartenders. We've got some good quotes and videos and whatnot on there from what bartenders say about it. We can certainly talk about the distillery and the history uh, behind the brand. And, of course, like any good spirits website, we have cocktail recipes. Well, we started to say, wait a minute. What if we told this in the form of a story arc? What if we mapped this out and said, hey... We want to sort of think about how the Wheatley Vodka consumer might actually get to know the brand, get to know about it, get to a point of wanting to consume it. Would they have any hesitations to it? Um, and how would they overcome them? And we started to align those things with a story arc and map that story arc and the content that we had to answer those questions up to our social content so that we are inviting people to the website, but not with a Here's Wheatley Vodka. Go to our website. Here's Wheatley Vodka again. Go to our website today. Here's Wheatley Vodka a third time. How about going to that website? Instead of doing that, it's, hey, this is Wheatley. Let's tell you the narrative. Well, the whole project came about where we said we want to make a craft style vodka. And then the next thing after that was we wanted to name the vodka. And we had some conversations about that. And one of the things I said was, no problem using the name Wheatley. However, there's some, when you use that name, it's gonna be good quality. And we're not gonna compromise in any way because it is a family name and we 
I think a lot of it, obviously. So uh, we we were focused on delivering a a uh, authentic product with the Wheatley vodka. So we're taking the videos from the website that tell the story and explain the story, and we're cutting them down into the narrative pieces that go into that story arc, and we're rolling that out on social in a pattern that takes the consumer through that narrative. And it looks like this. Hey, there's a new website. We'd love for you to come see it. When you get there, we want to, you to get to know the brand. We want to get you to know Harlan, a little bit more about vodka and about our craft process. And then as they start to get to know more about vodka, we want them to reach the point where they sort of understand that what we're saying and what Harlan says a lot over and over again is Wheatley is the way vodka is supposed to taste. Not a lot of people drink vodka neat. Vodka is something that you typically mix with things because vodka, the way we've been served vodka for decades, is kind of, whoo, ha, mm. yeah, that's how you react to vodka, right? Well, Wheatley is one of those vodkas that's it's been taken care of. It's crafted, and he's made it so you can actually sip it and go, oh, that's what it's supposed to taste like. That's actually not bad, right? You can sip on that. You're probably going to want to flavor it a little bit with a lemon or a lime, but it's actually good neat if you want to drink it that way, which is certainly the way people prefer to drink scotch and bourbon and whatnot. So, but we want you to get to a point where you're thinking, wait a minute, Vodka, this is the way vodka is supposed to taste. Well, if you start to say, I, I don't believe it. Vodka doesn't taste that good. You got to mix it with stuff. Now we're going to say, okay, well, look at the awards. Look at the reviews. Look at the bartender insights. Look at the quotes that the bartenders are saying about us. They are saying, you know what? You can even drink this vodka neat. So they're reinforcing what we're saying. So we're trying to overcome those objections. They get down here and they start to look at cocktail recipes and food pairings. They might uh, see uh, bar and store experiences where we're doing things that we're putting out there on social. And now they're starting to think, okay, I got to give this brand a shot. I got to check them out. So now we've gotten to a point to where we're encouraging them to order a cocktail with Wheatley in it if they can find it in a bar near them or maybe get a bottle and have a home bar presence where they're potentially serving it to the people around their home. And then they get to a point to where they're satisfied uh, of knowing that they're going to be a, a knowledgeable vodka drinker now because they understand more about what it takes to make a really good vodka. And then they're a smarter drinker at the end, which is the ultimate payoff. So we've aligned and mapped the content that we have to the customer journey of trying to get them to being a smarter drinker and knowing more about vodka and understanding that Wheatley is the way vodka is supposed to taste to this story arc, and that's how we're fueling a lot of the content that we're putting out there on social. So this is your storyline. Your storyline, this is kind of the, the blank uh, template for you. You need a story hook. You need that first thing that's going to get someone interested about your brand. And then you need them to go on a journey to discover more about you and your company and what you do and why you do it. The plot thickens. This is where you give them that interesting background. You want to get them to a point of learning. To, to they, they feel they've accomplished something by knowing and understanding you to the point they're like, you know what? I want to try this. I want to, to buy this. I want to experience this. I think this is a smart decision. And then you're going to want to feed them content that allows them to overcome any of those objections they might have. Now, if you don't have a high dollar ticket item, you're not going to have the same type of financial objections that someone potentially buying a car might have. So, but you're going to know the barriers that your consumers have into converting. Maybe it's location. Maybe it's supply. There's going to be some obstacle in their way for Wheatley Vodka right now, quite frankly, because it's so young and uh, distribution is always an issue in the spirits industry. One of the biggest uh, problems on that downward slide uh, and that hesitation slide for Wheatley is just people can't find it. They've got to you know, search it out and be able to overcome that barrier, uh, which is actually getting it going to a liquor store or a bar where they offer it. And then you've got to get them to a point to where they can apply that learning and make a change in their behavior. I'm going to purchase this instead of what I was going to do, which may, may be purchase some, something else or maybe purchase nothing at all. And so that's how you want to feed your content to them at that point. When they start to get to the point to where they're purchasing, you get them to realize the benefits that they're experiencing by purchasing, and then you get them to where they think they're having a better experience and become a loyal or a repeat customer. And so that is 
your story arc. Now what you have to do is you have to go out there and plug your story and your brand into it so that you have a blueprint to do the same type of thing, to take your customers through a journey, a narrative to get closer to your brand and convert better and more effectively using your social channels and your content marketing to be able to get them there. And if you do that, then they will walk away from your social channels, your website, your email, and contact with your brand, remembering what you want them to remember. But you got to do the work. So do the work. Look at your brand. Define your audience. Plot their point of curiosity and map their journey. That's what I've got to share with you today. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. So we have time for one question. One question, and it can be about bourbon. Anybody, anybody, anybody? Anyone? My favorite bourbon, there's our one question, my favorite bourbon. Okay, I'm going to answer this honestly because I work with uh, a number of the Sazerac bourbons, and I like a lot of them. My favorite Sazerac bourbon is Weller. I prefer Weller 12-year. Uh, I'm a weeded bourbon guy, which is sweeter, softer bourbon. Um, and Weller is the flagship weeded bourbon from the Sazerac brands. But my favorite bourbon is actually not one of my clients' bourbons. My favorite bourbon is Elijah Craig Small Batch. It used to be 12 year. They've taken the age statement off of it for a lot of reasons. But my favorite uh, bourbon is Elijah Craig because that's my dad's bourbon. And uh, when I came out of grad school, uh, I was kind of a rum and coke drinker. And I went to hang out with my dad at the family farm. And he said, let's have a bourbon. And that was an experience we shared, and that was another connection to my father, and that's my, that's my favorite bourbon. It's that emotional connection. So thank you guys for your time. I'll hang around okay. with you a little bit. Okay, I